Good evening. I'm Sheffield Hale, and um, welcome to the Atlanta History Center. Before I start talking about what we're going to talk about tonight, I want to um, do some shameless promotion and say, if you haven't seen our documentary Monument, Untold Story of Stone Mountain, check it out. Um, it's 30 minutes, and I think it's worth your time, and I think you'll I think just about everybody will learn something. And, and, and anyway, we're very proud of it. And these uh, QR codes are available out there. It's on our website. Um, Monument, the untold story of Stone Mountain is on YouTube. So check it out. It's free, and it's only 32 minutes out of your life. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the author talk, tonight's author talk featuring Mark Whitaker discussing his new book, Saying It Loud, 1966, the year that black power challenged the civil rights movement. If you've not yet purchased your copy of the book, they're available outside, 25% off, just for you tonight. And he will be in the lobby following the um, event signing books. Um, we'll have some time for, uh, for questions following his uh, uh, initial discussion and, and the talk tonight, so um, um, be thinking about what you might want to ask. Now to introduce tonight's talk author and book. Mark Whitaker is a journalist and author. During his long career, he was the managing editor of CNN Worldwide, the Washington bureau chief for NBC News, managing editor of CNN Worldwide, uh, uh, CBS News, chief for CBS News, and a reporter and editor at Newsweek, where he rose to become the first African-American leader of a national news weekly. He's currently a contributing correspondent for CBS Sunday Morning. His other books include his memoir, My Long Trip Home, and Smoketown, the untold story of the other great black renaissance about Pittsburgh. Mark will be in conversation with Vern Smith, author and former Newsweek Atlanta bureau chief and national correspondent. His time in Atlanta as a journalist also included covering some of the most important stories in the past several decades, including Maynard Jackson's campaign for mayor, the Atlanta child murders, and the 1996 Olympics. As an author, he's, Vern's written both fiction and nonfiction, including Brother, Brothers, Charlie Coe, What Vietnam Did to Us, My Soul Looks Back in Wonder, Voices of the Civil Rights Experience, and The Jones Men, a novel, a novel. Relevant to this conversation, in 1966, he was a student at San, Fran San Francisco State University. Please join me in welcoming Mark Whitaker and Vern Smith. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming. This is great. Um, I've known this gentleman, Mark Whitaker, for a long time, and so it's such a pleasure to um, engage in this conversation with him. Um, so, Mark, welcome to Atlanta. Thank you, um, everybody, for coming. You know, when you set out to write a book about black power, um, did you, you didn't know you were going to zero in on the year 1966. Talk about how that came about. Well, you know, I started thinking about writing this book uh, about six or seven years ago. And uh, after the Black Lives Matter movement really sort of started to take shape. And, you know, as I was kind of watching that, uh, a movement in some ways built around a slogan that was sort of galvanizing uh, people, um, uh, led by young people, um, who were not only uh, raising questions uh, about what was going on in you know, mainstream white society, but also in some ways were challenging a kind of orthodoxy of, of leadership within the black community, I thought to myself, you know, that kind of sounds familiar. <laughs> um, it sounds a lot like the black power movement. So. You know, I was partly interested to sort of go back and, fu and learn more myself about like exactly what had happened in that era and what lessons uh, could be drawn from it. The other thing, as we were talking earlier, um, is that uh, my dad uh, was actually the first head of African American studies at Princeton University. And when he took that job in the late 60s, my parents had gotten divorced uh, six years earlier, and he had dropped out of our lives. He was living in L.A., um, and I hadn't seen a lot of him. And then all of a sudden, he takes this job. He's on the East Coast. You know, I start to reconnect with him. But 
he looked different. He had, he had grown an afro. He was wearing daishikis. He taught me the black power handshake. So, you know, I never, you know, I was, at the, I was 12 years old at the time. I never, you know, didn't know I was going to write a book about it. But I think there was something kind of that always fascinated me about that kind of shift. So I, uh, so I decided I wanted to write about the black power movement. And to be perfectly honest, I, I, my initial idea was I'm going to write a narrative history because, you know, as a journalist, that's kind of what I can do. I can write history, but with, you know, a real narrative uh, feel to it. And I knew that the, the, the slogan black, uh, black power had really become popular in 1966, you know, thanks to Stokely Carmichael. So I kind of thought that that would be my beginning point. And for some reason, I thought I was going to go all the way to 1972 and through the Angela Davis trial. And the end of my book would be her acquittal. And so I started working. I spent an entire year beginning my reporting and research, and I was still in 1966. <laughs> so much had happened in that one year. And I was, honestly, I was feeling overwhelmed. I was thinking, like, how am I ever going to do this? And it's going to be, you know, how am I ever going to get it in less than, you know, a thousand pages? And, and then, actually, you know, I was, uh, my editor at the time sadly passed away in the middle of all of this. She, I was having lunch with her, and the last lunch I had with her, and we weren't even talking about this, but she must have picked up that, you know, I was, I, I, I needed a little more focus. So she encouraged me. I don't know if any of you have ever read a book called The Guns of August by, by Barbara Tuckman. Yeah. It's a classic book about the, the story of World War I, but told through the first month of the war. And I had read it a long time in school, but, you know, but anyway, and so, and I had started to listen to books, you know, audio, audio books, and it was on sale on Audible, <laughs> so I downloaded it, and I listened to it, and it, it was really that, it occurred to me, you know, if she can tell the story of World War I through the first month of the war, I can tell the story of black power through the year 1966, so that's how it happened. So, so that, uh, the cover photograph of your book, which is that iconic moment when uh, Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael come together in Mississippi, um, which people trace back to the evolution of when black power became like a phrase in the, in the American lexicon. Talk about how that moment uh, came to be. So, so the, the, the the photograph uh, on the cover, uh, taken by a, a, a photographer who did a lot of uh, photography in the civil rights movement named, named Flip Schulke, was of Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael going back in, in the summer of 1966 during the Meredith March, uh, which was, in a way, modeled it, 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 it uh, James Meredith, who had become famous for integrating the, the, the University of Mississippi, um, uh, by this point in 66, he's in law school in New York. And he decides, he was a little bit of an eccentric guy, he decides to go down to Mississippi and have his own solo march across the state uh, to encourage black folks to register to vote. And he, he begins his march in Memphis. He shows up. He's got this pith, like African safari pith helmet, an African cane. And you know, he's going to walk across by himself. And on the second day of the march, this drunken white supremacist jumps out from behind a bush along the highway and shoots him with a bird gun. Luckily, it was a bird gun, because if it had been a real gun, he, he, he would have been dead. Um, but he's injured badly enough that he has to go into the hospital, can't carry on his march. And the leaders of the, uh, of the big civil rights uh, groups decided that they were going to come down to Mississippi and carry on his march. And so it's going to be kind of like the Mississippi version of the Selma march. The, the, the march uh, against fear. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, right. And so instead of Selma to Montgomery, here they're going to go from Memphis to finished the march going all the way to Jackson. And uh, during, it was in the middle of that march when they reached Greenwood, Mississippi at a nighttime rally after he had spent all day in jail uh, 
after being imprisoned for trying to set up tents in a black schoolyard for the marchers for the night that Stokely, who you know, started chanting. Yeah, but until then, like at these rallies, the chant was freedom now. Right? And the speaker would say, what do we want? And the crowd would say, freedom now. And Stokely started saying black power. We want black power. And this field full of 500 people in the Sandlot field in the middle of the night in, in Greenwood, Mississippi, chant back, black power. You know, it goes back and forth and back and forth. And literally, you can trace it overnight. There's an AP wire news story the next day um, about this, this rally and this chant. It gets picked up in over 200 newspapers across the country the next day. How do I know that? There's an archive for all of you who do research this day called newspapers.com, <laughs> right? And just, and it doesn't even have every newspaper that was around there, but it has a lot of them. I could do a count of the, num of the number of newspapers that picked up that one wire story. And so all of a sudden, people around the country are reading about black power, black power. Three days later, uh, Stokely is, is, is booked on Face the Nation. They fly him to, uh, to, uh, um, to DC. Anyway, but during that march, they also made a detour to Philadelphia, Mississippi to honor, which is where the three civil rights mo uh, workers, um, Goodman, Turner, uh, Cheney, and, and, and uh, uh, Mickey uh, uh, Swir Swir Swirmer, uh, were, uh, were killed two years previous during Freedom Summer. And, um, and anyway, and that turned into... So, uh, so, so let me ask you seven. this. Did, did AP get it right? Because 200 papers, this black power is disseminated across the world, really. Well, that, the one thing I will say about that photo of, of King and, and, and Stokely, but it relates to the press, is that from the moment Stokely became a national figure, he had just taken over as the chairman of SNCC, deposing John Lewis in another, the whole chapter about how that happened. There was this wild vote at the end of a SNCC retreat um, where they had to vote twice and it went on all night long. Anyway, in the end, Stokely emerges as the new chairman. Um, and then he gets all this attention for black power and the press immediately starts uh, portraying him as King's nemesis. King's the moderate, he's the militant, you know, King's the older, he's the young generation. Actually, their relationship, if, if you read the book, it was more complicated than that. On a personal level, they actually had a lot of respect and affection for each other. Um, but, you know, clearly Stokely was more militant, and King, as soon, King knew that there was a, a big, risk, and in fact, a probability, and he was right, that once black folks started talking about black power, like, it would drive, people would go nuts. <laughs> like, the press would not understand it. Everybody <laughs> would assume the worst. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and indeed, that's, that's what happened. Um, so, one of the things that I, I like about uh, what you do in, in saying it loud is you connect the Southern movement, figures from the Southern movement to the black power movement that goes north and west. And talk about the link between Lowndes County, Alabama, and what became known as the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense out in Oakland. Yeah, so, so what happened in 1966 in general? There was this shift on a number of fronts. Right, so there was a shift in tone and message. So the, new, the black power generation was talking about uh, different tactics. They were saying we don't wanna be, they weren't necessarily immediately talking about violent confrontation, but they were saying we should, we think we should at least have the right to defend ourselves, particularly when you're dealing about, you know, the deep south places, you know, and, and, and also we have a real problem with the police in these northern cities which tragically continues to this day, as we all know. Um, so there's a shift in message, there's a shift generationally, but there's also a shift geographically. 
So until 1966, the great battlegrounds of the Civil Rights Movement had been almost all in the South, right? Birmingham, Memphis, uh, Birmingham, Selma, um, Memphis, where King was, was eventually assassinated. And, um, but now, in, in, my, in, in the book, it starts, you know, there's, uh, in the South, Sammy Young is killed, you know, in Tuskegee, Alabama, um, Julian Bond, is, uh, is elected uh, to the state legislature and then denied his seat because he had come out against the war. That happened in early 1966. I have a whole chapter about that. Um, uh, uh, SNCC, which had been, it, its activism had been, you know, all in the South. Uh, until then, um, this change in leadership happens uh, there. And then you have the Meredith March. But, then, the, then everything starts to shift towards the North. King, it's the year that King tries to bring his version of the movement North to Chicago and, and, and confronts violence that is as bad, if not worse, than, than what he had encountered in the South. Um, and then in, uh, by, the, by the fall, uh, th in Oakland, California, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, at the time, two community college students at a local community college in Oakland form what we now know as the Black Panther Party, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense with the berets and the leather jackets and the guns. Well, the, the, the very, their, their, their name and their slogan actually was taken from the original Black Panther Party, which was formed in, in Lowndes County, Alabama by Stokely Carmichael, uh, who had spent the year leading up to and into 1966, he had been the SNCC field uh, organizer, field secretary in Lowndes County, which uh, was had right in the middle of the state, had one of the uh, uh, blacks were, were, you know, had a majority of the population, but were mostly sharecroppers and had been denied the vote for 60 years. And Stokely goes in there, the, and initially just to organ, just to get help, you know, the local black activists register black folks to vote. But then he realizes that in a place like Alabama at the time, which was, you know, George Wallace was the governor. Um, what was the point of having the vote if the only candidates you had to vote for were white supremacists, which is really who controlled the state, the Democrat, the white, you know. They were literally the, 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 the symbol of the, of the Democratic Party in Alabama. Well, it wasn't a donkey, it was a rooster. And their slogan was white supremacy for the right. I mean, it was right out there. I mean, there was no, anyway. So his, the original notion of black power um, was that uh, stood for, we're going to take this a step further. We're not only going to register black folks to vote, we're going to encourage them to form their own local political party so they can elect their own candidates to sheriff and, you know, other local, uh, local offices. And so, and it was kind of a miracle. They went into Lowndes County. There was already a local activist on the ground who was already, you know, registering black folks named John Hewlett. Stokely and the, and the SNCC workers come in, they partner with, with John Hewlett and his local organization. And within the space of a year, they, uh, they register several thousand poor blacks to vote. Um, and then they get the wheels in motion to start forming a new independent black political party. It was called the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, but in, in Alabama, under state law, there were so many people, black but also white in Alabama, who, who, couldn't, who were illiterate, who couldn't read, you had to have a symbol uh, so that your party could be identifiable on the ballot to people who couldn't read. And they chose the Panther. And that's where the original Black Panther title, logo, drawing came from. And Later, 
just a few months later, in, out in, on the other side of the country, <laughs> in Oakland, California, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, essentially there had been pamphlets from Lowndes County that had made their way to, to, the, to the Bay Area, partly because there was a Bay Area activist named Mark Comfort who had gone down to provide security for this nominating convention and brought back some of the pamphlets. And then also later, Stokely came to speak in October of 1966 at the University of California, Berkeley. And to promote his speech, they brought more pamphlets out there. And Huey, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale see these pamphlets. They see the Black Panther logo, and they say, that looks cool. We're just going to we're just going to take it <laughs> and steal it, and they did. I mean, it's a, I mean, it's, it's you know, it all started it was, in Montana. But this is all within literally. This is why again, '66 is so fascinating when you think about something that started in like this little impoverished, you know, <laughs> you know, rural county in Alabama, making its way all the way to Oakland. Yeah, I mean, uh, so so it was it was brilliant marketing on, on Stokely's because, because he talked about the the the, the coil panther ready to spring. <laughs> right, right. And it, it was the phrase was like catnip to the to the media, right? They 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 called them the Black Panther Party in Alabama rather than the formal name. Yeah, right? no. So I mean, this was a, this was both. The, uh, and it was Stokely in particular, but also Huey, I would say the same thing about Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. You know, they're, they, you know, you talk about marketing. Another thing that I think really um, uh, distinguishes this this period and this and this sudden shift in the movement. And you know, King had been, you know, and and his generation had worked with the media, and you know, they were quite media savvy. Hank. Klibanoff, who's out here in the audience, won a Pulitzer Prize for writing about the relationship between the press and the civil rights movement uh, of, that er of that era. Um, but both consciously and just because of who they were, in a way, the black power generation took it even a step further, right? I mean, they were just, there, there, there was this kind of intuitive brilliance about what would get the press's attention but also just seem cool to young black folks, yeah, yeah. right? There was something about the sound of black power, right? There was like, you know, and this guy, they actually borrowed it from this guy, Mark Comfort. He was wearing the berets and stuff before them, but, you know, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, like right out of the box, they had this cool uniform with the berets and the leather jackets and the, you know, and so forth. So that, that drew the attention of the press. Um, but um, you know, but but with that attention also became a lot of assumptions that the press made about what they stood for, and as you'll you know if you read the book you'll see, uh, they were not really prepared to um, to answer the questions that they got they got asked. You know, and and so about, about what does this mean, and are you talking about violent revolution, and you know. You know, part part of what initially endeared the Panthers to the to the black community was the free breakfast program. Right, right, right yeah, yeah. And 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 um, a lot of young black people, you know, tumbled to them be, be because of that. But talk about the 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 famous moment uh, uh, at Sacramento when when the Panthers. You know, the, the, the fear of the Panthers took on like... So that, yeah, that, hap that happened in early 67. It was a couple of months later. But so the thing, you know, it's interesting because the, one of the things you'll discover, and, and it is true that, um, you know, with the Panthers, once Eldridge Cleaver gets involved, he was far more provocative and radical even than Huey and Bobby were, you know, at the beginning. Stokely, once he got all this media attention, it kind of went to his head. They started calling him behind his back, you know, within, within SNCC. <laughs> his fellow organizers called him Stokely Starmichael. <laughs> um, you know, he, but, but um, so, but the, the initial idea of black power um, uh, and what it stood for, particularly in light of what's going on today still, does not look crazy at all, right? So for Stokely, it's essentially this idea of political organizing, right? It's like, 
black folks, if, you know, it's not enough to have the vote. You actually have to organize and elect your own candidates, right? Well, that's not crazy, you know? I mean, eventually, it didn't really happen. It, eventually, this guy, John Hewlett, was elected the sheriff uh, of, uh, of Lowndes County. But it's that model of organizing that leads pretty quickly after that to black mayors and, you know, black congressmen and, and, and so forth and so on. Meanwhile, the real original core idea of the Panthers when they started in the fall of 1966, they had their famous 10-point program. I have the whole 10-point program in the book. A lot of it was, frankly, very, you know, unrealistic. You know, um, all black prisoners should be released immediately from jails. Well, you know, they, they had no way of making that happen. But the one thing that they actually was, they were planning to do, was this idea of civilian patrols to keep an eye on the police, right? And, um, and the idea was that, and this had been already, there were similar patrols in other cities. There was one in LA after the Watts riots where folks would basically get together, they'd ride around looking out for situations where police were interacting with you know, folks in the community and just like stand, not confront them, but just like stand on the other side of the street where they could be seen, like we have an eye on you, right? I mean, when you think about like, how do we even know about, right, what happened to Tyree Nichols and what happened to you know, George Floyd and so forth, it's because now of cell phones and body cam. Well, they didn't have that then. So it's sort of like, a, we're gonna be like the human witnesses, right? And, um, and then the, 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 the twist that, that uh, Huey put on it was, Huey, who is this really interesting sort of self-taught guy who had had all these learning disability problems when he was young but had taught himself to read and then became an avid reader, and he would spend all this time in law libraries, and he discovered that at the time, um, California had what you call, what's called open carry gun laws. So it was legal to carry guns in public as long as they were visible. And so his idea was just to take this civilian patrol idea, except you know they were gonna have guns yeah. because they had the right to have guns, right? Yeah. So, so that's what they started to do. And that's all they were doing. And really they didn't have a, you know, they were doing it mostly in Oakland and then, you know, surrounding areas. They didn't have a big national plan. But of course, as soon as uh, white folks saw these young black guy, you know, men you know, going around with guns, immediately there was a move to repeal this open carry law. And uh, it was, uh, uh, there was a, a Republican uh, state official, a, a, a legislator named, named Mulford, Don Mulford, who introduced this act to repeal the open carry, it was called the Mulford Act. And in early 1967, the Panthers go up to watch the debate in, at the Sacramento, uh, at the state capital of Sacramento over this bill, right? And they show up with their guns and with their uniforms and so forth. And all of a sudden, these pictures of these Panthers in Sacramento start running in papers across the country and on TV and of course, that was the greatest marketing coup for the Black Panther Party. They didn't even have to, uh, Panther chapters started to form spontaneously all over the country yeah. because all of a sudden all these young black people wanted to be Panthers. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a lot of Atlanta yeah. in, 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 in your book. You, 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 you basically rescue some names from obscurity. You know, Bill Ware, who's a name that only the uh, true um, yeah, but what, you grew up in, in, in Natchez, Mississippi, who was where my you came from. Boy. But but I wanted you to talk for a minute about um, a woman leader during that period. That, that that you know when you would when I was reporting and talking to the, the icons of the civil rights movement, Andy Young and, and Jose and so forth, it was like one woman's name 
there would always like, you could see the deference that they had for this woman. Ruby Doris Smith. Talk about who Ruby Doris Smith. So Ruby Doris Smith Robinson, she was, Smith was, was her maiden name and then, and then she married a fellow named Cl Clifford Robinson and, and took his name. Uh, she uh, grew up in Atlanta um, in the Summerhill neighborhood. Uh, she uh, went to Spelman College. Her older sister had gotten involved, was one of the first leaders of the sit-in movement, um, lunch counter movement that started, you know, uh, in, in 60, 61. And, and Ruby would kind of like, tail, you know, idolize her older sister and, and would kind of, you know, ask to go along with her to these protests. And, uh, and so she ends up getting um, sort of, you know, she's still in her teens at this point, but, you know, swept up into what grew out of the sit-in movement, which was SNCC. And um, after, you know, she goes to jail a couple of times, she, you know, meets, meets all the, you know, other leaders, and partly because she wanted to, you know, continue her education, uh, she comes back to Atlanta, enrolls in Spelman, but is working part-time and then sometimes full-time in the SNCC headquarters here in Atlanta. And she becomes the ass assistant, the top assistant to Jim Foreman, who was the executive secretary. So in this period, John Lewis is the chairman, but John Lewis is really out fundraising and giving speeches. He's sort of the figurehead, whereas the person who's actually making things run who does the budgets, who does the hiring, who kind of, you know, is Jim Foreman. But, you know, as soon as Ruby <laughs> is at his right-hand side, it's really Ruby who everybody says as much as anybody was yeah. really running things. Yeah. And she was, you know, she was really tough. Everybody was intimidated by her. You know, she just didn't take it from anybody. Um, and so then, uh, by 1966, in this same retreat when, uh, when, 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 jo when John Lewis was, was, was deposed by, by Stokely Carmichael in this vote in the middle of the night, Jim Foreman had announced that he was stepping down. He suffered from ulcers and so forth. And basically, there was unanimous support for Ruby Doris becoming the new execu executive secretary of SNCC, right? So, at this point, she's still 25 years old, and she is the highest ranking woman in the entire civil rights movement, um, in a more powerful position than anybody you know, had ever been. Maybe the, the closest thing you get to it before then was Ella Baker. Um, and, um, but of course, there's almost no press coverage of this because of just the sexist nature of the thing. It's like all the coverage uh, is about Stokely, and there's very little about Ruby Doris. Um, and, but, so what's interesting is that, so she was, you know, she was never really that ideological. Like, for Ruby Doris, it was just like about doing the work and like what worked and so forth. But, you know, she, she was kind of sympathetic to this, you know, slightly more militant, you know, um, mood. Definitely to the whole cultural side of black power, which is, you know, kind of just um, how black folks are going to kind of present themselves. She was one of the first women in the movement to, you know, wear, you know, the, 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 an afro, you know, the natural look. Um, and um, uh, so, and, and so when they started sort of rallying around the cry of black power, she, 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 was, she was supportive of that. But then she saw Stokely just go off on, like, just this, you know, you know, he spent the entire summer just going around, giving speeches, being outrageous, you know, being provocative, getting more attention. Um, and she saw the effect that it was having on the organization. Like fundraising was drying up. Morale was bad among the troops, among the, ab among the organizers, because, like, they felt like they didn't have any leadership and what was Stokely doing, you know, going, giving speeches in the North when they were trying to organize in the South. And so by <clears throat> in the fall of 1966, there's an executive retreat of the new leadership. And in 
preparation for this retreat, Ruby Doris writes this really tough memo in which he says, we got to talk about what Stokely's doing and the, and the, and the, and the negative effect it's having. You know, it's, 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 it's like, I understand why people, you know, love this slogan and, you know, it gives them an emotional high, but it's just not doing us any good, right? And, and he calls, she, she circulates this memo, they have a forces, uh, 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 Stokely to, to address this criticism at the meeting. And he promises, he says, okay, I'm gonna cool it, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna lay low for a while, no more of these speeches and so forth. Um, and then of course, like, almost immediately he's invited to speak at Berkeley <laughs> in front of the whole campus and he, ac and he accepts <laughs> the, the invitation. But the tragedy with Ruby Doris is that in early 1967, she uh, got very ill. At first, for several months, they didn't know what was wrong with her, but eventually she was diagnosed with terminal cancer and she died in 1967 at the age of 26. Two-year-old child. And I tell that whole story and it's very moving, but it's, what's really sad is, you know, by early 1967, Stokely, Stokely only lasted one year as the chairman of SNCC, you know. And, and he said after a year he was burned out, he stepped down, whatever, but, you know. Um, and then he's replaced by someone who they thought was gonna be more low key, but ends up being even more provocative named H. Rat, Rat Brown. <laughs> and by that point, they've kicked all the white people out of SNCC. That's the other thing that happens this year. And I tell the whole story of that, how, how that happened too. It finally, it, it had been building all year long. It finally happens at yet another one of these retreats at a, a, a black Catskill resort named after a one-legged tap dancer <laughs> in Peg Leg Base. Peg -leg -base. <laughs> after a retreat where everybody's like high, they're all fighting with each other and they're, and they're and smoking a lot of dope, doing drugs. And at the end of this, the last remaining white members, and there weren't that many still left by the end of 1966, but they're, they're officially expelled. And um, anyway, so the, you know, you can't, I certainly as someone who spent, you know, five years living in this period and really getting to know these characters. Ruby Doris is not only, not only is someone she, who absolutely deserves to be better known than she is, but also you can't help feeling that, you know, if she hadn't died so young, that, you know, she, she would have been a major force mm. and mm. Might, have hap, might have kept things from unraveling at SNCC the way they did, but whatever that was, she would have been a major force within the movement, you know, and you know, and and it was a tra it was a, it was just a tragic loss. So, so before we um, turn it over to the audience for some questions, I I wanted you to speak on what you write about in the book about your observations, the the, the link between the Black Power movement and the Black Lives movement today, the the both the the you know, the evolution and, and, and the cautionary tale that you see. Well, you know, I see, I see a lot of, um, you know, here are the parallels. You know, first of all, I mean, I talked earlier about how Black Lives Matter, it was kind of ground, you know, grassroots, young, uh, a movement started by young people in the streets. It was started, you know, in, in directly as, you know, in, in, in as a result of police violence and in reaction to that. But indeed, the black power movement, I mean, all of these turning point incidents in 1966 <coughs> actually start with <coughs> an incident of a police, police encounter with, between, between cops and, <coughs> and, 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 and black folks in, in all these different places. In Atlanta, there's, you know, there's one in Summerhill, a riot in the fall. In, in Hunter's Point, uh, right before the, um, Ronald Reagan is elected governor in California. Um, so this issue that we're still living with today was very much right there in the middle of everything um, in 1966. The other parallel that I saw in terms of the genesis of Black Lives Matter is, 
The other thing that the, 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 the black power movement was, was responding to was the heartbreak of what happened, the experience they had had in trying to organize the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. If all, anybody knows about Fannie Lou Hamer, that was her organization. They had, during Freedom Summer and before and after, you know this, you know, it was happening in, in, in your hometown, um, they were organizing these black folks to form a faction within the Democratic Party. And by 1964 and the, and the, and the, the uh, presidential uh, uh, con Democratic Convention in Atlantic City, they thought they had a deal to bring this black contingent of, 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 of Mississippi Democrats to the convention and get them seated instead of the white supremacists who ran the official Democratic Party. And at the last minute, essentially, Lyndon Johnson, who was about to be nominated for president, and Hubert Humphrey, who was going to be his vice president, double-crossed them. They only were offered two token seats, non-voting seats on the floor. Fannie Lou Hamer said, I didn't come all the way here to, for no two seats. <laughs> she leaves. So, so, they, so in the same way that the black power movement had kind of lost faith in kind of traditional two-party politics, there was part of the Black Lives Matter movement that after Barack Obama in the first as the first black president thought, wow, we elected a black president and he didn't do as much as we had hoped he was gonna do about these issues of you know, particularly criminal justice and so forth. So, 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 those, so, so a lot of the, you know, the start of both movements, there are just a lot of parallels. Now, then the other thing is like, okay, well, what are the lessons? Well, I would say there are a lot of lessons that you could learn from studying this if you're a young black activist today or any kind of activist, social justice activist. One is about messaging, right? You gotta be careful in your message and you gotta be able to like explain what it is. Like it may sound sexy, but you know, Stokely Carmichael wasn't really prepared for the way in which the term black power would be distorted by the press. No. And when he would, had an opportunity to set the record straight, he didn't do a great job at yeah. it, all right? So unity, there's a tremendous amount of infighting in 1966 within these groups, amongst them, which ends up just hurting the cause. Same thing, I think, Black Lives Matter. Allies, you know, we talked about 66 being the year that essentially white people are kicked out of SNCC, and I think a lot of, a lot of people who were very involved with the civil rights movement, white allies, you know, would they be called now? I, I, I interviewed a lot of them, and, and a lot of them are still very bitter and kind of like in shock about how that, what, how that happened. So, you know, I think, you know, I think, I think the, the value and the necessity of allyship is, is another one. And then the final one is leadership, right? So I interviewed Alicia Garza, who's one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, in the fall of 2020, after all the great, you know, the, the historic interracial marches for racial justice across America and across the world. And she had come out with a book, and I interviewed her for CBS Sunday Morning, a show that I do some work for. And she was saying, and she writes in the book, and I, I, you know, I, I asked her about this. She said, well, you know, leadership is overrated. We don't really, we don't, we don't need a leader. We just, you know, everybody's a leader, you know? And I don't agree with that, and I say this at the end of the book. Um, you know, I think that, um, and I understand why she and others, because there have been a lot of leaders who have been disappointing, but if you look at, you know, the really historically successful uh, uh, racial and social justice movements, not just in America, but around the world. Look at uh, Gandhi in India, look at uh, uh, Mandela in South Africa, um, look at the early suffragette movement here in the United uh, States. Um, the, um, they've, they've needed young energy and, and, and grassroots, boots on the ground energy, but they've also needed like very, you know, smart, mature, disciplined leader, leadership from the top. And sadly, my conclusion after spending an entire year thinking about 1966 is 
The one person who could have provided that for this generation was Malcolm X, and tragically, he had been assassinated a year earlier. But I think if he had still been around, I think he would have be become the figure that they all would have wow. would have rallied around. That's fascinating. So uh, Clarice uh, is going to circulate through the audience. Can I just say, while, while you're, just start raising your hands and I'll answer questions. But, I, but one of the reasons I, I, I wanted, I asked Vern to have this conversation with me is he's part of this story too. Because Vern, so there's a whole cultural side of black power that happens in 1966. It's the year, you know, when people start wearing afros. They say, we, don't, we want to be called black rather than Negro. Um, it was the year of first Kwanzaa, you know, and so forth. But it was also the year where, while he was a student at San Francisco, it was then San Francisco State, what's now San Francisco State University, they formed the first black student union at a predominantly white school and then started pushing for black studies. Uh, which, you know, which eventually led to a strike and the, the formation of an official department a couple of years later. And you think about how black studies have been in the news recently, you know, in Florida with DeSantis and so forth. This guy was president of the creation of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, how you doing? So you can also have questions for him, by the way. <laughs> okay. Is what I'm saying. Okay, but this question is for you because you were talking about Lyons, Alabama, the county. Mm -hmm. uh, in the recent news, and where I was there, um, they named uh, about 20 miles or so after Bob Metz, who also was from Atlanta, mm -hmm. Georgia, and he moved there, and they did this last year. And uh, so I understand because I kn know most of the people that were still living when I moved here uh, and their activities and whatnot, how things got from the East Coast to the West Coast. Yeah, yeah. Because he made it there and he had also served with some of the other people in the P Black Panther Party. Wow. So uh, for me, that was quite interesting because I looked at the, the bits and pieces of the political piece. Right. And uh, they only, they started electing people in Selma, and right. they ran for office, but a lot of people just ran away like they normally do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and make it a, a desert island. Yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, one lady you mentioned, uh, do you really think, had she lived with all the men, because there were white women that were still with SMIC, that yeah, I started yeah. with in the legislature. Yeah. Um, that were active, do you really think that they would have been able to bond together the white and the black? It's a, it's a really interesting question because actually even before 66, uh, at the end of 64, uh, all these white, a lot of, the, the high watermark for, for white participation in SNCC was, was after Freedom Summer <clears throat> because all of, Bob Moses, the legendary organizer, and others had had this idea of recruiting white students from colleges around the country to go to Mississippi for, for the summer uh, in 64. And a lot of them, it was like a life-changing experience, and a lot of them then wanted to become official members of SNCC. And um, so, and so I think the, they, they admitted an additional 80 white members or something like that in the fall of 1964. And they all had one of the, the retreat, the big retreat that year happened at a place called Waveland, Mississippi. Um, and so they all, you know, go there for the week. And it was at Waveland, Mississippi that two white volunteers in the Atlanta office of SNCC named Mary King and Casey Hayden Casey Hayden at the time was married to Tom Hayden, who was the founder of the Student for Democratic Society. She just passed away a couple of months ago. Um, circulated a paper talking about sexism at, within SNCC. <laughs> she was saying, and she, they say in this paper, they say, women are treated in SNCC like black people are treated in white organizations. You know, and they then, they left SNCC, they got involved with the civil rights movement, and then both of them became involved in the women's movement. But there are a lot of people who basically uh, 
trace that moment as kind of a seminal moment of kind of like the beginning of what became the, 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 the women's movement. Um, so, I mean, you know, um, yeah, so, so, you know, people, people were, people, people were, were, you know, there was a time, a brief time in the early 60s when black and white, you know, there were all these people who were kind of on the same page and, 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 and issue number one was civil rights. But by the late 60s, you have a lot of white folks, particularly white, young white men who are actually more focused on Vietnam than on civil rights. You have women who start, you know, forming their own women's rights movement. So, so uh, you know, and, and even without, you know, so th there was infighting involved, but I think there was also a natural kind of drifting apart with people starting to focus on, you know, things that they thought were the most important to them. You know, so, so I, I would say, um, one of the interesting things about the, the black studies movement at San Francisco State is that um, it was a movement led by black students, but it was very multiracial. There were Asian students, there were Latino students, and there were white students uh, in, in, in that movement. And then toward the end of, of, of the student strike, there were also um, faculty members that, that joined in the, in the struggle for black studies. So, you know, the fact that these activists were willing to follow the lead of black students and not vie for the, the leadership the way you, you had seen in some previous yeah. um, Also, uh, Also, you know, in retrospect, you know, black studies, when you think about the demand for black studies, First of all, right now that seems like completely reasonable, right? <laughs> yeah. When you think about what had been left out of the history. But you also have to think about what was the alternative. I mean, this was a period where, you know, there were a lot of people, particularly once the Panthers got even more violent, they were showing up at New Haven, at Yale, and other college towns. They wanted young people to pick up guns, right? Um, to the degree that, you know, black power was the new black nationalism. When you go back to Marcus Garvey and previous nationalist leaders, they had talked about, we got to go to Africa. We got to find a homeland someplace else. So, so the fact that there were, that, that for, for you, know, a, you know, a lot of these, these the, 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 the sort of cultural black power generation, all they wanted was black studies. I mean, when you think about it, you know, that's not un, at all unreasonable given, uh, given, given what the alternative might have been. Sir. So a few a few years ago, we had Cleveland Sellers here. Or, excuse me, yeah. the Atlanta History Center had Cleveland Sellers yeah, here. Yeah, he's, 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 he's a pretty big figure in this book, too. And he's like a lieutenant to Stokely Carmichael. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And he spoke a lot about the time that he and Stokely spent time with Dr. King right. in his home. Right. And I'm curious, in the book, and would you elaborate further about how Dr. King then adopted the term black power? Yeah, there are a lot yeah, of speeches but, that articulate him saying that and his transformation. So he was open to the influence. I mean, he was, it's hard to say he was old. He died at 39. Right. But he was definitely influenced yes. by um, uh, Jim Bevel and a number of other people who were younger than him. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, and so um, they had, Stokely and, and, and Cleve Sellers had gotten to know Dr. King even before uh, the Meredith March. Um, uh, when he would come down, you know, they were organizing uh, down in Mississippi um, and then later in Alabama, and he would occasionally come through town and they would show for him around. And they, they respected him. Um, he actually liked hanging out with them. You know, you forget how young Dr. King was. It was kind of like a vacation for him, I think, a little bit to be out there with them. Uh, and then they became even closer during the Meredith March. And the... It's a very, very interesting story, and it was like very badly, I think, reported by the press at the time. Um, not by Hank, but, <laughs> but by, you know, the, but there was this idea that like they were at, you know, that, that, that Stokely re represented this, this, this threat to Dr. King. And in fact, you know, Dr. King was really wrestling with a lot of uh, 
you know, he, he definitely understood the, the appeal of the notion of black power. Um, both the, the political organizing part of it, uh, but also just the identity, the cultural part of wanting to be just more kind of vocal about, um, uh, about black identity and black community. He got all of that. Um, and he did, you know, at once everybody started talking about black power in the middle of the Meredith March, you actually go back and you look, and you, you look at some of his, 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 his own speeches and his own statements, and he was starting to use that term himself a little bit. Um, but I think that he was much more sensitive um, to how it could be misconstrued um, and used against the movement. Um, and he was not wrong about that. Um, so, but, but as you know, you know, he, he, the Dr. King, you know, there's this, somebody came up with the, the term, the Santa Clausification of, of Dr. King, right? You know, so, so it's like the, the, you know, when we, at MLK Day every year, it's kind of what, it, everybody trots out, like, you know, the I Have a Dream speech and, you know, and so forth. But, you know, King was becoming, in his last years, Part, to some degree, pushed by the black power generation. I mean, they came out against the war before he did. You know, he would, probably would have gotten there anyway, but, you know, but he was becoming, both in terms of his opposition to the war, his focus less on just pure legislation and on, you know, housing, jobs, um, and, and he, he was becoming a more, you know, radical figure, you know, um, in his own right. And I think also more, the other thing that black power really stood for was a, a kind of a skepticism about how, how real this dream of integration was, right? Um, I mean, basically what Stokely says over and over again you know, and certainly what Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, they lived it in, 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 in Oakland was, you know, this dream of, 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 of racial integration, you know, that King conjured up in, in, in Washington, that that was only gonna really happen for like a small, like a, a middle-class, well-educated black folks. Like white folks had no interest in being, in integrating with sharecroppers in the South. Whites had no interest in integrating with, you know, you know, folks in the inner city in places like Oakland, right? And um, so, and I think by the end of his life, I think Dr. King himself had realized that, you know, that was not, you know, um, it, you know, maybe I don't know that he had given up on it entirely, but I think he saw that it was, you know, um, the, 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 you know. Uh, the idea that it was really going to happen as quickly as perhaps he might have thought earlier um, just was unrealistic. Hi, Mr. Whitaker. My name is Tara Coit. My question, I think it's an extension of what you're talking about now. Your title refers to black power challenging the civil rights movement. And I understand why challenge is a great word for a title, mm -hmm. but in the reality, is it challenging or is it more an extension of civil well, rights or I think, expansion? Yeah, we, we talked a lot about that. Um, I think challenge is, you know, I think is, is you know, we decided was, was, was the right term because um, it, it did form in partly in opposition to, you know, I mean, they, um, uh, Stokely, uh, um, uh, other SNCC leaders, you know, the Panthers, they all um, thought that the previous iteration of, of, iteration of the civil rights movement ha had been too cautious, too moderate. Um, uh, and, um, but, so to that degree, they were, you know, um, they were, they were sort of challenging a lot of assumptions and a lot of strategy and a lot of tactics. 
but it also presented a challenge to the civil rights movement. Um, uh, apart from whether, you know, Stokely was deliberately trying to, you know, pick fights with, with Dr. King or not. Um, and it was a, 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 it was a challenge that, you know, was reflected in press coverage. So all of a sudden, like the movement had to deal with this way in which the press was covering this new, you know, phenomenon of black power. Um, you, you see it reflected in the poll numbers. Newsweek magazine, which was doing a lot of polling on racial attitudes in, in those days, um, did, they had done this big poll in 1963 that actually showed that views were changing for the better um, within white America for support for the civil rights movement. In 1966, that changes like almost overnight as soon as people start talking about black power. Um, and then you have the whole rightward turn in the 1966 midterm elections, um, which really is the beginning. Ronald Reagan's elected governor of California. Lester Maddox is elected the governor here in Georgia. Um, George Wallace, who's term limited in Alabama, runs his wife as a total political novice, Lurleen, and she wins in a bigger landslide than he ever won in, which positions him to run for president in 1968. So you have this you know, huge backlash. Uh, white backlash, not just against black power, but against the whole civil rights movement that's, that's starting um, in, 19, uh, in 1966. So, you know, it put, you know, it was a stress test, you know, on a lot of different fronts uh, for, for, for the civil rights movement. So that's kind of what we were trying to, we were trying to convey. Um, uh, it, it, you know, in, in, in some ways it was an extension, it was the next phase but it was also a next phase that um, was making things in some ways even more fraught and more difficult even for the previous generation. Does that make sense? My name is uh, John Michael, and I've been at various points in time, like at North Carolina T in Greensboro. <clears throat> um, I wanted to ask you, there's a gentleman that lives in Decatur Named Willie Ricks. Yes, he's Mikasa. He was on the stage at yeah. the time. Well, he invented. He came up with Black Power before before Stokely. That's yeah. correct. Yeah, I, I, tell I just that wanted story. to add that as a footnote. Yeah, no, I tell I tell the whole story about how that happened. Yeah, I hadn't got to your book yet. Yeah, okay. But we did purchase it. Um, there's so much. The Reverend. They called him the Reverend. The Reverend Ricks because he was such an. Uh, he was a exciting. street person and he was a very powerful person, but well learned. Yeah. Um, and Willie Ricks put his life at risk a lot of times. And that's one thing I wanted to, to put out there right now. It was called the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Mm -hmm. The one constant in this struggle in North America from the first slave landing is violence yeah. against black people. I'm just a part Cherokee, violence. And now we see this coming back. So there's a lot of things I wanted to ask. Cleveland Sellers is a friend of mine. He lived in Greensboro when five people were killed in the Greensboro Massacre, right. which you might be familiar with, yeah, yeah. in broad daylight right. by fascists and Klansmen, right. led there by a police informant named Dawson, which was never covered correctly at the time, but now you know how we appease later. Mm -hmm. So I'm very concerned that these times are reminiscent of like the coming in 39, as uh, Gil Scott Heron used to say, of fascism, open fascism like Charlottesville, and the Klan, and the way we vote here in Georgia. Who could imagine, at that time even, that you would have an open, fascist-minded person like our congresswoman, Miss mm -hmm. <laughs> Green? Yes, yes. So my concern is, and I wanted you both to comment, is where do you think this is going with taking books out of libraries, uh, like book burnings, and it's a, it's a comeback of all the things that many of us have fought against for all this long. Yeah. And then we see uh, guns in Georgia. We have a congressman in Athens who's a per, who is the proverbial guns don't kill people, people kill people, right. and he owns a gun store. <laughs> so what we have in Georgia, unbeknownst to just of most people is a return of all this white supremacy yeah. and other things that set us back. 
Yeah. So I want you both to comment on this era we are in right now. Well, I would, I would say two things. One is, you know, so I, I was writing this book in 2020. And in the midst of, you know, all the, the marches after George Floyd's murder. And, you know, people would hear that I'm writing this book and they would say, oh, you know, that's so timely. And, you know, um, and, you know, I thought, well, it's only timely, <laughs> you know, when the book comes out. But, but also, I felt like, because I was living it in terms of research, I said, there's going to be a backlash to this. Like, there's no way. And people were saying, oh, this, is, this time is different. It's transformational. White people finally get it, you know. And I said, no, no, no. You know, if you know the history, you know the backlash is coming, right? So then the other thing that your comment makes me think of is, you know, so we're... There's this question of, like, you know, <laughs> what's the right metaphor for our history, right? And, and particularly on race, right? And so we all like to think people still invoke Dr. King and the arc of the moral u universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But sometimes it's really hard to see things that way, right? And so then, you know, particularly with, in, you know, r thankfully it wasn't until that long ago that people even kind of, like, really understood the way in which Jim Crow, you know, was a backlash against Reconstruction, right? But I think we've now, you know, people are more familiar with that idea. So, so then the other metaphor you hear a lot is like two steps forward, one step back, or one step forward, two steps back. The one I like, for what it's worth, and again, my last book was about Black Pittsburgh, where August Wilson came from. And so August Wilson wrote a play for every decade of the, of the 20th century, the century cycle it was called. And his play set in the 1960s, as it turns out, was called Two Trains Running. So that's, that's how I view the history of race in America. It's two trains running, right? There's, there's the train of progress, and then there's a train of backlash and, and regression, and they're always running. <laughs> and they're like on a, on a race with each other on two separate tracks. And sometimes it looks like one is pulled ahead, but then it's not long before the other comes along. Because just to take Georgia, and I don't, you know, I mean, just from as a New Yorker who just, you know, observes what's here, everything you say about Georgia is, is true, but it's thanks to Georgia that Democrats are still control the Senate, right? Raphael Warnock is, you know, the idea, you know, of him being in the Senate and what he stands for and where he comes from and what his potential is, in my view, you know, that's not something, you know, what Stacey Abrams has, has, has achieved. So, so that's, the, that's, that's the good train in Georgia. And then you have the bad train in Georgia. And you have that everywhere in America, you know, kind of like, and they're, and they're both running. And they're trains, right? They're, they're trains. They're powerful. Both are powerful. They can run you over, you know, in the in the in the in you know in the wrong circumstances. Um, and I think you know, I think it's it's been that way since the beginning. I'm not sure that I see that ever ending, or at least not in, so, so, so in my life. What, what I would say al along those those lines is that you know, it's still that same struggle that that was the promise of emancipation you know full, full citizenship and equal protection under the law and so the, the the thing that I concentrate on and that gives me hope is that what I see threading through all of this is black resilience you know you knock us down but we get back up and um, what I've seen in my own life and, and, and what you write about is that each succeeding generation, because the yin and the yang that you talk about is, is affecting them, they, young people, young black people, find, they find their way of resisting because they don't have a choice, you know. And if we ever get 
get to that promised land, it is going to be because of that black resilience, you know. And, and that's the thing that keeps, keeps me hopeful. No, and, 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 and you'll see if you read the book, this man has the last word. I have an epilogue in the book, but the last chapter, the last four pages, are just come from an interview that I did with him at the end of a chapter where I talk about, you know, the birth of black studies and Kwanzaa and so forth. But, you know, when I interviewed Vern, he talked, you know, in a way that I just, like, I, I, there's, there's no way I could have written this that, that would have put it better than the way he said it, so I just quoted him about, you know, the, the transformation yes. that black power represented to you and your generation in terms of being able to embrace with pride, yeah. you know, who you were, not to be embarrassed, not to be ashamed, to view it as a strength yes. rather, than that, rather than a weakness. Absolutely. And that's, that's where the resilience comes from yes. because you can only be resilient yes. if you believe in yourself. If you in that believe way. in yourself, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things that you really kind of extend that thought when you yeah, read and, that and, book. And honestly, you know? I, I think, you know, it, it's, that's the note I end the book on. I mean, I have this epilogue where I talk about, you know, the craziness that happened after 1966. But the, 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 the most, I think, you know, at the end of the day, the most, you know, like the political stuff, you know, it, it, you know, there's progress and then there's setbacks and then there's fighting and then there's, you know, and the politics never ends up being as successful or as transformative as, you know, you originally think it might be or hope it might be. Yeah. But the cultural and the identity part of black power, that was profound and that it remains. And that is irreversible. Yeah. Absolutely. You are never, ever, ever going to get black people to feel and about themselves the way that white America made them feel before the age of black power. There, there is no going back on that. Um, and and as, as Vern said, you know, it's taken for granted now. <laughs> you know, um, you know the idea just that you can be whoever you are. You know. You know, you can, be in a, you can be a lawyer, you can be a doctor, you can be an academic, you can be like, you know, <clears throat> you can have any kind of job. And, you know, you get to be yourself, you know, you get to like, you know, you can wear your hair long, you can like, you know, you can, you know, you can, you can listen to rap music, you can, you know, whatever. It's not this idea that, you know, the only way that you can, you can, you can uh, survive in white society is, you know, to essentially kind of present as being kind of a black version of a white person <laughs> or like whatever, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and it's not just personal identity, it's communal identity. It's communal identity. I mean, Vern was talking, <laughs> there's this funny thing about how, you know, so he arrives and he's at San Francisco, I mean, he should tell the story, but, um, but, you know, and, uh, and what, there were probably less than 100 black students on the entire campus? The, yeah, yeah, when I first right? got and, yeah. and they were sort of balkanized, right? So that you had like the frat, there was like a black fraternity, right, sorority, right, 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 right. you were an athlete, right, you met right. there were a couple on the newspaper, right, but like right. everybody was in their corner. Right. And then just tell them like black power happens all of a sudden like on campus, like you're walking across campus, yeah, and, yeah. right? You yeah, know. And, you know, and that was like, you know, you know kind of like, my, you know, and, and my brother, my sister. You <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, it was like, you know. I mean, the whole thing of brother and sister yeah. came out of that. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? of, of greeting each other. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like that. And yeah. black names. I mean, talk about yeah. yeah just yeah. talk. Just talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your friends, like yeah. that was the beginning of, of your friends giving their, yeah, their all, kids. Yeah, all all their kids African names. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure that like you know a lot of white people to this day probably like where do all these names come from? Yeah. Why do black people have such different names? Yeah. Well, you know, that's, it all comes out of black power. It's yeah. all like this I statement of identity. It was yeah. like, you, you know, as, as Vern said to me, it's like, it was like they talked about, you talked about your, your, one of your buddies from, from, from Natchez who was the first one to have kids and he started to give his kids right. these names, these right. African names. Right, right. And he said, you know, I, I want them from birth yeah. to know who they are yeah. and for the world to know who they are. It's yeah. like a proclamation of pride yeah. and community that you that you 
Yeah. You know, you give somebody that, that gift at birth with them. Yeah. yeah, passing it on, yeah, absolutely. We have one more question this evening, right back here. Hey, good evening. Uh, so first of all, Smoketown, excellent book, really enjoyed oh, thank it. thank you. Uh, second question that I have, and probably the most important one is, so 1966, obviously a very important year of transformation. It's now 2023. We're talking about the digital age. We're talking about all these social projects that we have going on right now. What kind of uh, obstacles, advice, uh, just nuggets that you may have to someone that might be trying to organize and really kind of raise social standing right now? Well, you know, I, I, you know, I was talking about that earlier. I mean, you know, I, I, look, I don't want to presume, you know, um, and, and, you know, I, you know I, I think what Vern said earlier is, is true. Like, each generation has to sort of, you know, rediscover it and reinvent it for themselves, you know. Um, but, so, but I do think that, um, look, I mean, history is always important. I mean, that's why, you know, you know, if anything, I think, you know, I mean, I hope that with this book, it, you know, I, I've tried, I worked hard to make it a good read. I think it's like, you know, there's a lot of human drama and, and so forth uh, in it, uh, as well as these big themes. But, you know, I do think, I do think there are lessons. Um, and um, again, as I said about messaging, um, unity, leadership, allyship, um, and, <laughs> you know, the, as a journalist, as someone who, you know, my career, has a career in journalism, I, I'm particularly interested in kind of the role that the media plays and the, um, the effect that media coverage has on these, these kind of historical moments. Um, not just in the way it's covered, but then how the people who, the players react to the media coverage, right? And that has become, that was always the case. I mean, you probably, if you go back to, you know, the 1700s, the 1800s, you could probably, um, entire books have been written about that too. But I think that in the modern era, with first television, to, you know, the, and this is right at the moment when really uh, uh, the, the dominant force in the media is shifting from print to TV. And one of the reasons that the black power thing took off so fast and became, is, that, is the way they looked, <laughs> right? It wasn't just about what they were saying. Um, and now you have like social media, right? And you, again, Black Lives Matter started literally on Facebook and Twitter. Right? So it was like the media piece of that story was there from the beginning and remains there, right? So I think about the early, the very early, the first really young generation, college age generation of civil rights leaders, the, the, the sit in movement that we've been talking about started, you know, in. In, 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 in North Carolina, and there was this uh, black clergyman, uh, Jim Lawson, who would conduct these seminars in a, in a church basement. Um, you know, Diane Nash, John Lewis, James Bevel, training them how to deal with the practice of, of nonviolent passive resistant protest, right? and how to maintain a discipline where you go out there protest, you know people, you know, the cops are gonna come, they're gonna beat you up, they're gonna take you to jail, and how you just discipline yourself to deal with that. I think about that now in terms of the media. I actually think that activists need media training or they should be training themselves, each other, <laughs> in how to deal with the media. Because, you know, you can, Sometimes, you know, like, you know, it's not always a conspiracy. Like, sometimes, like, there are troublemakers in the media. Um, uh, but, uh, but sometimes it's just the way, you know, things happen. Um, but, um, you know, you, 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 you have to be really aware of how whatever you're doing and saying is going to play in the media and how when the media comes and asks you, 
the provocative questions about you know, how you're going to respond. And it doesn't mean you have to you know, be any less militant or radical. You just have to be disciplined about it. Do we have time? This, Kurt, this gentleman had one more. Do you want to? I'll say it briefly. It, it, one thing about your, your, your discussion here, if yeah. I'm okay, is that you can't underestimate the pressure that we have for the future. I mean, that's what I feel about all of this, but that's why I wanted to bring that's it up. That's, that's the end of my book. That's the end of my book. Well, yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, well, that's, I, I get into that at the very end of the book. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. But, but, but look, I mean, I think one of the things that, that, you know, when you really go back and you look at the history, that is absolutely true. But there, all, these thi um, uh, uh, all these things can be true at once, right? I mean, you know, what, so, so there was no question the black power movement was up against it with the FBI and with the press from the very beginning. But there are also things that happened that were really the result of the decisions that they made and the fights that they had. And so, um, and anyway, I, I tried to get all of that into the book. Well, please join me in thanking Mark Whitaker and Vern Smith. Thanks for coming. Thank you. There are books for sale out in the lobby, 25% off, and Mark would be happy to sign it for you. So thank you again for coming this evening. Everyone be safe going home. Okay. I'm going to go.